Uh, this morning, it is our privilege to have as our speaker, uh, Dr. Jeff Hall. Um, Dr. Hall, join I told him he's going to have to, as he's getting ready to, to retire, he's going to have to listen to just really good things being said about him for a while. Um, he joined the Education Department in 1994 and was named Vice President of Academic Affairs in 2003. Um, which is why he has such an amazing breadth of institutional knowledge. And he is also responsible for hiring almost all of the pro professors that currently make up our faculty. So when you are grateful for your professors, you can thank Dr. Hall. And when you are not grateful, Dr. Hall probably didn't hire them. Uh, one of my favorite things about serving on the cabinet is the fact that I get to hang out with Jeff a lot. Um, He's got a wildly contagious laugh. When I picture Jeff laughing, I just picture him wiping the tears out of his eyes because he's, crying, he's laughing so hard. Um, he has a pastoral wisdom uh, that I think comes from this continued wonderment that he has at God's goodness and at the goodness of the gospel of Jesus. Um, for those of you who are astute chapel observers, you will notice that Dr. Hall is in almost every single chapel, and he's in every chapel because he says, I can't believe that I get to do this three times a week. There are a few people that I know that are respected as deeply and as broadly as Dr. Hall, and we're privileged to have him this morning. So please give a warm Scots welcome to Dr. Jeff Hall. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. I uh, quite a welcome. Yeah, it's good to be here. The uh, first full day of spring. Yesterday was the uh, vernal equinox, and it looks like spring. It's nice. Hopefully, you had a good weekend this last weekend. Mountain affair, the spring formal. It sounds like good things happen. As uh, Chaplain Lowe mentioned, I, I do enjoy chapel, and I've uh, had the privilege since 1978 of working at Christian educational institutions that have chapel as a regular part of their requirements. So for all those years, I've worked at a place that pays me to come and be a part of worshiping God on a pretty regular basis. It's just, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I, I so enjoy our time together. I so enjoy singing together and uh, hearing folks talk about what the Lord is doing in their lives. Today, um, I'd like to look at uh, some scripture. I, I don't know about you, but when I read scripture, a lot of times I'm comforted by what I read, but sometimes I'm scared by what I read. And today, I thought I'd share with you what I find to be the most scary passage in scripture and then uh, talk about that a little bit. This, this comes in the Sermon on the Mount. And there, are, it, it, as you think about the Sermon on the Mount, there's lots to be afraid of in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, there's like cutting off of hands and gouging out of eyes and things like that. But there is this part that comes in and whenever I read this, it, uh, it frightens me a little bit. This is uh, from Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And I read that and I, and I wonder, is that me? Is, could, could that possibly be me who does good things and thinks, thinks that I know the Lord but maybe don't? So I'd like, to, I'd like to think about that a little bit today and hopefully by the end of chapel we won't be afraid. That's, that's my hope. But, um, but the people of God have a habit of losing their way. And our stained glass windows around us remind us of that. Behind me, you see Abraham, who lied about his wife and gave her to the Egyptians. You see Jacob, who stole his brother's birthright. You see Moses, who murdered a man. You see King David, who committed adultery. And then 
killed the wife or the husband of, uh, of the woman who then became his wife. You can look in the uh, side stained glass windows and see people of our tradition, people who are Christians, and I trust we'll see in the kingdom of heaven who've lost their ways at various times. In the middle window, we see Augustine. Just read his confessions. Luther at the top, who we know is an anti-Semite. Over in this window, we have Jonathan Edwards, who owns slaves, and Abraham Kuyper at the top, that we really appreciate a lot of what he's done with the, with the briefcase there. His uh, racist views contributed uh, greatly to apartheid in South Africa. And these are, these are people like us, and, and who knows what we're doing in, in this day and age. Of course, there are contemporary leaders, I won't bother naming, but uh, probably some come to mind. Christians of notoriety who have uh, lost their way. Losing their way in, in various ways by uh, moral failures, uh, or perhaps just being assimilated into the culture and kind of unwittingly uh, taking on the behaviors and attitudes of those around us, or perhaps even theological heresies out and out. The passage that we just read seems to indicate that we can actually lose our way while doing and believing the right things, which to me is the frightening thing about all of this. The Pharisees were kind of famous for that. The Pharisees pretty much believed the right stuff and did the right stuff. Paul was a Pharisee. Perhaps they, they believed the right things a little too much, their, uh, the tradition of their fathers, and they did the right things, perhaps in an overly calculating way. And they were proud. And they were in the position of missing out when the living God was in their midst, they didn't recognize him at all. The, uh, the sin of the Pharisees feels like the sin that I would be inclined to, to believe the right things and to do the right things all in my own strength and to miss the living God. Maybe, maybe you feel that way as well. I think about... Um, the letter that uh, Jesus wrote to the church of Ephesus in, in uh, Revelation, in the second chapter. The scriptures say, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do, not, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So the church of Ephesus was uh, planted by Paul. And Paul probably stayed there for two or three years on his third missionary journey. Folks there were discipled by the likes of Timothy and Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos. Some traditions even say that the apostle John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, went there to live. Then by the 90s, we have this letter warning the church of Ephesus to return to its first love. History tells us that uh, sometime by about 200 AD, there was no church in Ephesus. So how do we avoid dead orthodoxy? How do we avoid doing the right things, believing the right things, and forgetting the living God? 
we believe the right things, just like the folks in Ephesus did. The folks in Ephesus were patient. They bore suffering faithfully. They didn't tolerate false apostles, and they hated the Nicolaitans who were Judaizers trying to reintroduce Jewish law as a way toward righteousness. We here at Covenant College believe the right things. Our professors, every year in their contract, say that they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, that they subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Our staff submits to the staff commitments. You students submit a statement of faith in order to attend here. We believe the right things. We do the right things here at Covenant College, just like in Ephesus. Just in Ephesus, uh, in Paul's letter, uh, that directly to, to the Ephesians, he says to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, they rooted out evil. They didn't grow weary of doing good works. Here at Covenant College, we do the right things too. The employees of the college are held to very high professional and moral standards. Students sign a commitment to live by the standards of conduct. We do the right stuff here. Who do we love? Now, in Ephesus, they evidently lost their love that they had at first. And here at Covenant, are we in danger of that? Are we in danger of loving being right and doing right more than loving the Lord? Jesus calls the church of Ephesus to repent to the works that they did at first, to their first love. If not, their lampstand would be removed and the church would die. Here at Covenant College, of what do we need to repent? I'm pretty certain that if we lose our way, our general pattern will allow us to believe the right things and do the right things while we lose our way. And that is my greatest fear for myself as well as for the college. So we stand in the need of repentance. I don't know about you, it's, it's taken me a long time to even begin to know how to repent. I don't know if you're aware of a discipleship program called Sonship. It was popular a couple of decades ago. Kind of introduced the gospel in a very personal way that, that uh, the, the person going through the course could um, be confronted with the gospel and of Christ's love for them and the, the fact that it's not really us that, uh, that does our salvation, but it's, it's Jesus. I, uh, I went through the program a few times and had really good answers to uh, most of the questions and workbooks that we went through. Really believed the right things. And then my wife Lynn and I uh, went through the Sonship program with our pastor, Cal Burroughs. Cal was our pastor for about 30 years. Cal is a real mild-mannered fellow, except when he's discipling you. He was pretty much a bulldog and didn't let me get away with just easy answers. And I, I'm pretty sure I was in my 50s at this time. And for the first time I came to a fuller realization of what it means to repent, to really turn, turn away. Up until that time, you could, you could ask my wife, Lynn. And uh, the pattern in our marriage was that uh, Lynn, who is sensitive and loving and uh, is aware of the Holy Spirit's working in her life, would repent. And I thought it would be kind to minimize the repentance and to explain how this could happen to anybody. So Lynn would repent, I would explain. Sometimes I think that's referred to as mansplaining. <clears throat> it's one of my gifts. <clears throat> I was so good at it that uh, in fact, Lynn, in her own heart had decided to accept that that's just the way our marriage was gonna be. That she would repent and I would explain. And we would go that way for the rest of our lives. When I, when I first 
started to repent at all. She said it was the first time that she painted the picture uh, verbally of saying that she had gotten into the boat and thought I would never get in it with her. And to say, I think you finally got in the boat with me. That, that was a real uh, realization to me of my own shortcomings as a husband, my own shortcomings as a believer. But I think that the mansplaining would allow me to go on believing the right things and doing the right things while not really loving my wife and not really loving my Lord. So maybe you could examine your heart to see if you're a little bit like me. Maybe you won't have to wait until you're in your 50s to begin to truly repent. So we're talking about love here. Our, uh, our friend Henry Krabendam, maybe you see him on campus from time to time. I know he's uh, given a chapel or two recently. And, uh, and, and, a, and a friend, Nick Barker, for whom the faculty lounge is named, who had my job before I did, did it for 25 years. When he retired from that job, uh, he enjoyed still coming to chapel and would sit in the second row back on the last seat over so he could stretch out his legs. But he came all the time as well. <clears throat> Both of them like to say the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. So what does, what does that mean? We, we need to return to our loves. We've heard a lot about love uh, in the, in the last, uh, last week or so here. We've heard a really profound chapel from Dr. Kapik that if you weren't here for that, I'd recommend that you uh, go back and listen to that or at least buy the book when it comes out. Just really helpful that we don't, we don't think deeply about love, we don't enter into it as deeply as, as we possibly should. Even our chapel on Friday with Dr. Keynes, I was so impressed that uh, someone who is 75 years old and looking at the end part of life came and talked about one thing with you, and that is making sure that you're loving Jesus above all. It's only by God's grace, repentance is a gift, that we can turn and embrace God, but we should be engaging the ordinary means of grace, prayer and sacraments and listening to the word preached. We need simply to remember that God loves us, like Mary who anointed Jesus' feet at Simon's house. Psalm 103 has a couple of verses that, uh, that are just profound. Well, the whole thing, well, it's in scripture, of course it's profound. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. The, uh, the Being Human conference that we had just last week, Dr. Bieber Lake uh, remind us, reminded us to really attend to those things that, that are around us, that where our attention is focused really determines to a great extent who we are. So we need to take hold of the promises of God and I'm gonna read a, a scripture passage here to, to help us focus on love. This uh, comes from 1 John, very familiar. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, but whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So we don't need to be afraid. One of the things that is true through scripture is when God shows up, one of the things that's encouraging to me is that I am afraid 
when I read this passage in the Sermon on the Mount. That tells me the Holy Spirit is at work in my heart. And when God shows up in the Bible, or his angels show up in the Bible, the first thing that nearly always happens is God says, be not afraid. Don't be anxious. I will be your God and you will be my people. And we should embrace that. So whenever you come across something that frightens you, think about repentance. Think about God's love. Think about not being afraid. And hopefully by God's grace, we won't be fooled and we won't fool ourselves and we won't be surprised on that last day. And rather than I never knew you, we'll be welcomed as those who are good and faithful servants of the Lord. Don't be afraid. God has this. He loves you more than you ever imagined. I'd like to um, end our time together by singing a prayer. And um, we're going to be singing Come Thou Fount. Uh, it's in the hymnals. I'd like you to... Uh, Take a look at the hymnal, 457, and uh, invite uh, our musicians to come back and, and lead us here. We're going to sing this a cappella. And uh, it's said that uh, God inhabits the praises of his people. And uh, I would like to think that we will inhabit this prayer as well, even as God inhabits it with us. So why don't we all stand and we'll close with this prayer and then the doxology. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of
Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly peace.